This week on the agenda, up, up and away. Is the global tourism sector set for a stunning summer or is it still suffering a post-pandemic hangover? Worth nearly $6 trillion to the global economy, tourism incorporates many industries, including accommodation, transport, attractions, travel companies and more. But the cost of living crisis, the quest for greater sustainability and high prices in general are challenges for a sector where the effects of pandemic lockdowns linger. Tourism still hasn't recovered to pre-COVID boom time. In 2019, 1.5 billion international tourists took trips around the world. A year later, that dropped 74% with far-reaching consequences. More than 60 million tourism-related jobs were lost and some $2 trillion was wiped from the global economy. Pre-COVID, China was the largest contributor to outbound tourism and so an important driver of sector-wide economic growth. Chinese tourists made 170 million trips, generating $250 billion for the global economy. But lockdowns to contain COVID made traveling in and out of the country near impossible. International arrivals fell from over 145 million in 2019 to just 27.5 million in 2020. Restrictions were eventually lifted at the end of 2022, but traveller numbers are still only around two thirds of what they were. This Chinese New Year, over 300 million trips were made within China, generating $52 billion in domestic tourism revenue. But the expected tourism boom from Chinese visitors outside China in places like Europe hasn't materialized yet. With me now is Miguel Sanz, director of the European Travel Commission. Thanks ever so much for coming on the agenda. So, Miguel, is the global travel sector taking off again? Yes, hello. Thank you for having me. Um, um, yes, I do think that 2023 is going to be a fantastic year and it's going to be the full recovery um, in, in most regions and destinations of what it was uh, before the pandemic. So, so I think that 2023 is said to be um, a fantastic um, year for travel. Right now, it, it's the height of the, the tourist season, um, but we're already seeing a, you know, a summer of strike action. Pilots in Belgium, rail workers in Italy, airport staff in the UK, in Spain and beyond. And it's not then just holidaymakers who'll be affected, is it? Well, no, they, uh, definitely there is. The pandemic ha has caused a disruption in many industries. And, and, and this is something that... Um, any industry is taking time to adapt to the new times. Um, and I think that um, if I think the travel industry has demonstrated something over the last 50 to 60 years, it's, its ability to adapt to new situations. And it is true that, our, that there are difficult situations in some airports, in some destinations, and in some markets. It is true that there are some difficulties due to, to climate change. Uh, but I, I do think that, nevertheless, um, tourism is experiencing a boom in, in Europe by European standards, but also intercontinental tourism is experiencing um, um, a total recovery and beyond from what it was in 2019. So I, I think that, yes, there is a disruption in, in the industry, as in any other industry, really, after the pandemic. And, and due to the climate um, emergency. Um, uh, but I think that we are the travel and tourism industry. We are making a fast ad, um, adaptation to these new conditions. And, and this is an industry made by people who rapidly adapt and change to, to this new event, be in it climate, be in it uh, um, um, uh, labor or, or otherwise. 
I want to pick up on a couple of things you mentioned and hone in on what the, the pressures continue to be on the sector, what those main challenges might be to, to seeing recovery going just beyond the 2019 figures and really seeing the, the sector grow. You know, is it concerns about heat waves uh, and fires? Is it geopolitical uncertainty? Is it that the cost of living crisis that's squeezing would be travellers' purses? Those are, are, are factors that are, are, I mean, have to be considered. Um, um, climate change is not only something that is affecting tourism, and, and, and I say this, um, um, and I think it's important, climate change affects, first and foremost, the residents and the local communities where tourism happens. So, so it's not just something that disrupts tourism, it's something that affects, in, in this case, the entire globe and entire humanity. And it's something that every industry in this planet and in this in this world have to have to tackle. And and, and I think that the tourism industry is making huge efforts um, to uh, reduce um, carbon emissions uh, in their operations. Um, um, I can I can say that, for example, that last year um, um, Net Zero Hotel just opened in the island of Menorca in in the Balearic Islands of Spain. Uh, and, and and every company in the in the um, sector is making huge investments uh, uh, to reduce carbon emissions. But there are all the factors that we, we need to tackle. Um, geopolitical stability is one. And, and I think that travel, it is now considered by many people um, a, a right for everyone. And, and we have to try very hard, um, um, every country, uh, to preserve the right to move around countries and to preserve trouble. These disruptions, uh, we hope that they are, you know, as limited as possible. We hope that um, that um, these geopolitical conflicts uh, um, end as soon as possible. Uh, but I think that these are considerations that we have to take into into account when we plan our our, you know, tourism strategies. And and also inflation, as we were mentioning before, is something that we have to work on. Um, and, and that the, the industry is going to adapt. It's not just the travel industry that, that has to uh, work within the bounds of unpredictability, but I wonder where you see the future trends coming from that are going to be engines of growth for the sector. It, ecotourism, um, slow travel, are things like those just fads that are going to pass or do they really have potential to, to disrupt the industry? I think what we have seen in our report from the European Travel Commission is that people um, are considering more and more travel off-season. So um, uh, interest in traveling in spring and autumn has increased over the last years. Um, uh, not just because of the heat waves or because of climate change, also because um, maybe it's, it's cheaper, it's easy to uh, exp have a, a, a nicer experience. Uh, so I, I'd say that, that off-season travel will be a trend over the last over the next uh, a few years. Um, I think that um, consumers are going to be conscious about um, how to travel um, to reduce their carbon emissions, but also of their impact on local communities. I think it is very important that uh, we as travelers. Um, are also aware of what is our impact in the local communities and maybe all traveling at the same time um, is having a, a, an impact which is, 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 is it, it can be a spread throughout the year. And also the development of, of new product services and experiences in the travel sector. You know, over the last years, especially in Europe, Travel has been from the north of Europe to the south of Europe for a beach and sun holiday uh, uh, to relax and, and, you know, and, and to you know, stay away for a while to recover from all those months of, of, of bad weather and, and, and hard work. Um, and I think that travelers are getting more savvy. Uh, interest in travel comes from a lot of places. And I think we are going to see a di diversification of interest in yeah. travel um, uh, in the years to come. Miguel Sanz, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me.
as we've heard, pre-pandemic, the Chinese were the world's most important targets for global tourism. And while the numbers of Chinese tourists heading overseas is rising, it's still some way off the highs of 2019. So how long might it be until we're, until we're back to those levels? Or has Chinese tourism changed for good? Joining me now is Steve Saxon, the leader of management consultants for Kinsey's travel, logistics and infrastructure practice in China. Thanks for coming on the agenda. Now, China is, of course, one, if not the most important markets for the foreign travel industry. What has the impact of China opening up post pandemic been so far? Back in 2019, mainland China was the world's largest outbound travel market. More than 150 million outbound trips were made from the mainland back in 2019, more than any other country. And therefore, China's tourists are incredibly important to many international destinations. And some locations such as Thailand or Vietnam or Maldives saw even as high as 50% of their inbound travelers coming from China. So these destinations love the fact that the Chinese borders are open and the Chinese travelers are willing to travel again. It's coming back gradually, but I think everyone is very optimistic for the re return of Chinese tourism. You say people are optimistic, but do you think that the global tourism industry was really prepared or prepared enough for China's return? The opening came quicker than many expected. But actually, it's also been as a, a gradual resumption of international travel as well. So the destinations and the providers in those destinations have had time to get ready for the Chinese travelers returning. There's been friction in the system, whether it's from getting passports renewed, getting visas reissued, um, airfares being relatively high. There have been a number of reasons why it's taken time for the Chinese travelers to come back. And that has given the destinations time to adjust. And why do you think Chinese tourism is such an important driver of economic growth around the world? Even with the lower growth expectations many are predicting from China at the moment, it's still going to be 25% of the future global growth. And we see all the positive trends in China. Um, there's a rapidly developing middle class who want to spend and spend on experiences. And there's an aging population. You've now got a new generation of more affluent retirees. And the retired population is a core market for, for travel. Do you think the, the COVID-19 pandemic reset the way Chinese travellers think about tourism, think about travel? Reset is probably a little strong, but certainly we do see some differences post-pandemic around what the Chinese traveller is looking for. It's no longer just shopping and seeing the key landmarks. Um, there's much more interest in outdoors, local experiences, and some amount of premiumization. so looking for more um, adventurous and more premium trips as well. Well, so look, tourism is vital to some economies. Spain, um, whose tourism sector benefits hugely for, from Chinese visitors, has seen flights from China increase fivefold since the end of zero COVID. What else is international travel doing to attract more Chinese visitors? Chinese travellers want to visit places which welcome them and want them to visit. And we've seen some countries shifting visa policies, for example. Some have removed visas for the inbound Chinese visitor. Others have made it easier, for example, introducing an e-visa. And given that visas have been one of the main friction points which has delayed in the return of international travel, countries which are adopting more flexible visa policies are certainly seeing Chinese visitors come back quicker. Um, beyond that, we see countries ad adapting to welcome the Chinese traveler. Simple things like Chinese um, signage in the airports, support of Alipay or WeChat Pay in international payments, um, audio guides in destinations in foreign languages, shop assistants in key, um, in, in, in key destinations ready to receive the Chinese visitor. China's inflation data missed expectations and the, the numbers showed that households are still you know, quite reluctant to spend. That's going to have an impact, isn't it, on, on domestic tourism in particular? Well, that's not what we see from our data, interestingly. Yes, there's certainly caution in the broader economy, but 
through the pandemic period, household savings increased dramatically. And when we survey the Chinese consumer, what do they want to do? They want to spend that money on travel. They've been at home for three years. They've not had the opportunity to travel and experience the world. And so, for example, in a recent survey we did, 35% of people said they wanted to spend more on their next trip, with only 15% saying they wanted to spend less. So even with a cooler macroeconomic climate in China, the consumer is still wanting to spend on travel. And what about that buzz that's around the travel sector right now? Sustainability, that, that hunger to be greener, to be cleaner, to be more environmentally aware, and not just from travellers themselves, but from the tourist attractions, um, from, from the airlines, from, from the hotels. What impact is that having? So we, when we survey the Chinese consumer, they all care a lot about the environment. It's, it, it, they list it as one of the key factors which is important for them. However, when it comes down to willingness to pay for greener, more sustainable tourism products, China is towards the bottom end of the list. Only 2% of consumers, for example, said they would be willing to spend 10% more for flights if they, um, for a sustainable flight option. So we're seeing it high in terms of perception, but relatively low in the purchase behavior at the moment. We've been talking a lot about Chinese travellers heading overseas or spending their money um, as tourists within their country. But let's turn things around. How ready is China to welcome international tourists back? Yeah, so look, let's put it in perspective first, which is the outbound market from China is six times as the size of the inbound market. Um, so sort of the, the, the world tourism destinations have got a lot more to gain from Chinese tourism resuming than China has from the inbound tourism. However, China inbound is important, um, both conferences, business and also inbound tourism. And we've seen already visas are now issued again and reasonably available. There, there's still some challenges in Chinese consulates in some cities to get visas back to China. We're starting to see inbound tours advertised again. Um, in Europe, for example, they're, they're, you see the same tour packages as we, as, as we saw pre-pandemic. And there's the number of initiatives to help foreigners be able to navigate China. Since um, before COVID, um, tourists could come and spend cash. Now, much harder. And we just see recent initiatives to help them use the mobile payment systems in China, for example. Steve Saxon, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Still to come here on the agenda, the question of sustainability. Can travel ever be truly eco-friendly? We are all connected. Across borders. Across continents. Connected by ideas. A shared humanity. Stay connected. Welcome back to the agenda. It's now clear that sustainability is the key driving factor for the future of the tourism industry. But how exactly can travel ever be truly clean? And what impact will climate change continue to have on the sector? Joining me now is Zoritza Urosovic, Executive Director of the United Nations World Tourism Organization. Thanks for coming on the agenda. Now, Tourism's direct emissions, so we're talking flights, um, rail journeys, car journeys, the energy used in accommodation, attractions, all of that accounts for 5% of global CO2 emissions. And then if you add in suppliers like laundry services and food, we're talking about 8 to 11%. So if tourism keeps on growing, won't emissions keep getting bigger too? The, the first time that uh, uh, the sector measured its impact was in 2007, and it was published a report with the UNEP on, in it's called the Davos Report. And uh, at that time, we measured the impact, the total impact of tourism, transport, and uh, uh, accommodation with uh, recreational activities was 5%. 
we um, we then um, since then we have been uh, uh, trying to support the sector in uh, shifting the patterns in reducing its carbon footprint in looking at uh, energy water waste and other activities to uh, to be reduced uh, in 2019, during uh, COP26, we published uh, a report with the OECD International Transport Forum, and that's where you took the numbers, and we account that uh, total transport, air, land, sea transport, represent 8% of global tourism emissions. We estimate that the other activities uh, represent about 3%, and therefore uh, this is where we... we we, I can say, can forecast the number of 11% of total emissions. We anticipate as well that uh, by uh, 2050, um, the estimation is that uh, because tourism is growing, yeah. uh, we will have 25% of, uh, of emissions. That said, what we have seen from 2007 to 2019, in 12 years' time, we have been able to reduce uh, the emissions when it comes to the various sectors and industries, being it transport, being it accommodation or recreative activities. What has not been reduced is the uptake of tourism, because we know that uh, until COVID, we had a 4% annual growth, a steady growth of the sector. So basically, uh, the point is that while the industry is reducing its impact, travel is increasing. And that is where uh, we need to work on as well. So how has sustainability influenced travel and tourism, the whole sector? Sustainability first is a key uh, element of the competitiveness of the sector. So basically, uh, many companies is uh, reducing their carbon footprint or the, uh, the, the emissions is as well reducing the operation cost. So it is a key factor which has triggered and led uh, many transformation, many changes, and many investments in sustainability. That is a very bold and very clear message. And I think it's healthy because uh, we all want uh, more sustainable practices and more sustainable offer. So that is, that is, uh, that is a, key, uh, a key factor. You say that there are lots of bold initiatives taking place, but do you think that the travel industry is moving fast enough to go green? I mean, after all, it is still very much a sector still in pandemic recovery mode. Yeah. We have, uh, we have uh, two big groups of, uh, I can say, uh, businesses in, in the sector. We have the big firms. I will speak about aviation separately. Uh, we have the big firms when it comes to accommodation, to operating and local transport. And then we have the small companies, the SMEs. The ones that are really advancing at an immense pace, at an incredible pace, are the big companies because they have the means to invest. First, they understand. Second, they can find the resources to invest because they can see there is a huge return on investment. What is more complicated is for the SMEs, which are 80% of the sector globally. And these ones are first having a difficulty to understand what they should do. And secondly, um, lending and green finance is not so easily accessible for small and medium enterprises when it comes to tourism. When it comes to the uh, to the aviation sector, you very well know. I mean, a flagship initiative from ICAO on uh, on net zero aviation and commitment from many companies. Um, the sector is very well regulated, and it is uh, uh, therefore uh, much easier to measure. When it comes to uh, tourism uh, activities, uh, um, hospitality, local transport, and, uh, and recreational activities, the sector is very disaggregated. So despite the fact that there is an uptake, it's very complicated to measure. Let's talk about consumers, though, and, and that desire to, to make their traveling more sustainable, because research shows that three quarters of consumers think sustainable travel is going to be more expensive, more expensive than other types of holidays. Why is sustainable travel more expensive? Is it the fuel? Um, is it inflation in general? Is it something else? It's a, it's a very complex question. It's uh, not easy to answer straightforward. But uh, the um, um, three quarters claim they want, uh, uh, they want sustainable travel and uh, maybe 15% book uh, sustainable properties because price is a key driver. In, uh, in booking holidays and uh, that uh, uh, there is a huge dichotomy between uh, what is expressed as, as, as a desire and uh, what is then purchased. 
Uh, that said, I, I do not believe that sustainable travel is more expensive. Um, as I said uh, today, uh, um, when uh, you reduce your operation cost, and of course you have an investment at, at, the, at the core, uh, which you need to reimburse, uh, then there is, a, there is a period, of course, where um, for, a, for a company the costs are equal. And of course, they cannot reduce the price, but I don't see uh, that the sustainable travel is more expensive. What is very clear is that uh, when you want to decarbonize and making uh, your travel neutral, um, purchasing carbon credits is one way. Uh, and company, some companies do that. They share that cost and burden, I can say, with the customer. But um, what I think is that uh, uh, people do not understand well uh, where the carbon credits go and when they purchase them. And I think this is something we as well are trying to work on with the industry. I want to know what you think about all these heat waves that are sweeping across Europe, uh, across China. Uh, to what extent do you think that all of that is, is, is highlighting the, the impact and the effects of global warming? Uh, and I wonder what impact that's going to then have on the travel industry. It is a huge issue. Uh, there are two, two aspects. One is that we need to adapt to it because for the moment we can't act on it. That is one element. Uh, adapting is actually uh, being very cautious in the places you go because it can have a health impact. That's uh, very clear. Now, on, on the market, uh, because of these heat waves um, and because the change in the weather pattern, uh, you can see as well that the seasonality has developed differently first because uh, the waves and the, and the heat are not uh, only in a peak during the summer, but we can see already that from the month of May, for example, to certainly October, we will have a great weather pattern. And I think there, let's maybe take it as an opportunity to expand the season uh, differently and address seasonality. Uh, of course, not everyone would be able to do that because, for example, if you have children and you need to follow strictly these two months, yes, then you might need to think about other destinations where you would suffer less of heat. Uh, it is very clear. But then, you know, what doesn't go in one destination goes in another one. I'm just saying, uh, working for, for, for a UN organization, um, I think the, the, uh, the volumes are going to be there. They're not going to be distributed evenly as they used to be. And uh, heat waves have to be factored and taken into account in any planning when it comes to business and offering, because one season is larger. And secondly, uh, you know that these are months where you might have maybe not uh, 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 an excess of tourism as in certain destination you can have. In Sweden, they've stopped glamorizing frequent travel. They, they have uh, some sayings now. They talk about um, flig scam which is flight shame, and they talk about tag script, which is um, train bragging. Uh, I mean, do you think this is something that, that, that's taking off? So instead of talking about being um, well-travelled, we're, we're all travelling well. I think that uh, we need to go the midpoint. Um, I think that uh, all, uh, all excess in, in any type of, uh, I can say, uh, a reward or punishment uh, might be uh, might be too much, but I think as well that uh, we have seen uh, that uh, during COVID, for example, uh, we we were obliged to do many things uh, uh, remote. Uh, we succeeded, of course, uh, not the same way as when you meet. Um, there is uh, no um, no better way to interact than when you meet, but uh, you can reduce the number of travel that are unnecessary. Uh, very clear. That's what we try to do as well uh, uh, where we are. But um, but actually, uh, yes, certain uh, certain travel might be necessary. Zuritza Urozovic, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You can watch every episode of The Agenda in full on CGTN Europe's YouTube channel. And for exclusive extra content from me, my guests and the rest of the team, don't forget to check out at The Agenda Show on TikTok. Coming soon on the agenda, powering the future. We'll speak to the co-chair of UN Energy, Damilola Ogunbiyi. But for now, from me, Juliet Mann, and from all the agenda team here in London, goodbye.